Let's uh, speak now to Sanam Andalini, the co-founder and executive director of International Civil Society Action Network, who joins us uh, from Washington. Can there be any military solution to this conflict? Well, it's, thank you very much for having me on. Um, it's been five years, and it's just getting worse. So even if uh, one goes by the notion that, that you know, Assad could bomb everybody or, or uh, the, the situation could be, you know, we could, we could get rid of some of the militias. The, the issue is that there is a political problem at the base of this. There, there were fundamental root problems, and you're going to have to have not just a political process, but a societal process to get beyond this horrendous five years. So uh, the, the military solution hasn't worked so far. It, it's, a, it's impossible to see how it could possibly work. Uh, moving forward, it's just getting worse. Yeah, but despite even what's happening in Geneva, which has been put on hold for a few weeks, trying to restart it next week, there doesn't seem to be any political will on any side to, to actually get involved, and presumably not helped at all by this being such a proxy war with, with larger powers getting involved as well. That, that's, that's been the problem from the beginning, that, that this is multiple wars being fought um, on the back of Syrians, essentially. And, and what we know from other con contexts, if you look at Colombia, for example, where, where finally there's a peace process going on, you need the will on the part of the warring parties, but you also need the voices of ordinary people, civil society, actually, that, that is, has been practicing peace and wants a peace process to work. And that means inclusion of those voices. And one of the problems with Geneva, or the processes so far, is that we really haven't heard the voices of ordinary Syrians in this. They're on the ground every day trying to keep life going and trying to maintain normalcy. But we don't hear them at all at the international level. They're, they're completely absent. And they're the ones who really matter at the end of the day. But it isn't the other problem here that Syria has been smashed. You know, when you look at Assad and his father in power, all around Damascus, that city survived on a middle class, uh, a mercantile middle class, who, who put sectarian differences, religious differences to one side. Can Syria be rebuilt now, given the diaspora of Syrians all around Europe and elsewhere? You know, Tim, we work with uh, networks of Syrian civil society activists, and they are still working within the country, working outside and, you know, across the, both in, now in Europe, but also in, in the refugee uh, areas in, in Turkey and elsewhere, and they are committed to having a Syria that, that you know, rebuilding and maintaining what they have. And, and that's, that's the point, that if those people disappear, if they all become migrants or refugees elsewhere, what is going to happen to that country? It, it, we, you know, the, the issue is looking at five years ago what could have been done to stop where we are now, and looking beyond from, from now to five years hence. And at the end of the day, those Syrians who've had the courage to stand up and fight for what they believe in without guns have a right to be at the peace talks. And they're the, exactly the ones that are missing. Everybody who has guns has a representative. But anybody who doesn't have, ha, has been fighting for peace without guns, is somehow excluded. Yeah, and, and as you know, I mean, Syrians in the Middle East are known for their business astuteness, their hard work. Those who have traveled abroad will undoubtedly be successful. But is there a problem at home, do you think, with the radicalization that has happened in the last five years, that some of those scars will never, never heal in terms of rebuilding? a country if and when we get to that point again you know the the, the radicalization the, the the folks we work with three years ago were telling us that our you know people will become extreme because extremist groups at the time supported again by Saudi and Qatar and others were providing food were providing weapons were providing uh, shelter protection and and the international community was not providing the necessary assistance at the time uh, it if the radicalization continues it's going to spread to the rest of the world as well, as we've already seen. So the problem is to maintain, to go back and say, what is it that we need to do? How do we help the Syrians who are active now to shore up what they have and to keep doing the work they're doing? They're, you know, it's, it's generations that they're working with. They're, they're working with young kids and so forth. Th that's, that's the only hope that actually I think we have. And, they, and as I say, they are the ones who are at most risk and, um, and, and being, their voices just aren't being heard. I'm afraid uh, we must leave it there. Salamandalini, good to speak to you. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on Global.